Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's episode of, Tri of Shop Talk, hosted by the Triangle Area SQL Server Users Group. So tonight with me, we've got Mike. How you doing, Mike? Doing well, thanks. And we've got on? Chat. How you doing, Chat? Anders uh, has chili of death. Uh, what are we shopping for? We are shopping for many things. Uh, a video card that's less than like a mortgage. I'm looking for, I was looking for one of those. I just decided to get, get a mortgage on the house to pay for a video card instead. But shopping for ice cream. Um, Jenny's ice cream is really good. I have a, some difficulty getting it down here, but you know, roll with that. Uh, we will shop for many things. Yeah, yeah, GPU searches are ridiculous. So I, it, you can't find them hardly on uh, most of the mainstream sites. I actually bought mine from a marketplace that is known for selling shoes. Because a buddy of mine, I was, at, I was hitting him up and I was like, hey, I can't find video cards anywhere. He's like, yeah, go try StockX. That's, and, that's what it is, I heard about yep. it. Yep. Researching investment stocks. Ah. Um, yeah, so they, they're known for, I want to buy this particular style of Air Jordans in this condition for this size, and they'll authenticate it and everything. But um, it is it is another marketplace that has their own specialization. A little bit higher quality than eBay in the sense that um, they do check the product to make sure that it is what you know people are, what you're saying that it is. Stream on a back MacBook Pro, so no GPU worries. Um, I mean, I've got a GPU now. It's just a couple of years old. And I was talking to Mike beforehand. Uh, I want I want to render these videos faster. I, uh, I, I'm going to use that as the reason that videos, that uh, streams take so long for me to post on YouTube. It's totally that reason. Definitely not laziness on my part. And also for the IRS, this is obviously a business expense. It is a business expense, by the way. So I got that going for me. So anyhow, blame AT&T. I'm down for blaming AT&T at pretty much any point for anything. So I'm with you, Anders. Um, missing three VODs. Ooh, yeah. Glad I could remind you. So purpose of shop talk. We have answers sometimes. You have questions sometimes. And when you don't have questions and we don't have answers, uh, I have a list of stuff to talk about. So we're gonna talk about some stuff. If you do have questions related to SQL Server or most things in the data platform space, hit them up in chat. We'll talk about that. And in the meantime, I wanna have some interactivity tonight because uh, this is, comes from an old colleague of mine and Brian posted a quick survey for people and Anders has, Anders has seen this before, but I decided I wanted to steal this thing. Uh, does SQL Server support change data capture? Yes, it does. It does in two separate ways. So there is change data capture, the uh, feature. There's also change tracking, which is a lighter weight version of, I just want to see what the latest value is as opposed to uh, or I just want to see that there has been a change on this record as opposed to uh, I want to know which attributes changed at, at what point. Number one game in town, derail the speaker. I've been off the rails for years. Ask my wife. So for Brian, for Brian, <laughs> who's, who's posted this wonderful uh, set of questions, I wanted to throw it out, get some thoughts from chat, and... Uh, say what I've got in mind as well, but he had he had a few interesting questions. The first one was, "What is the best named SQL feature?" Not the feature that works best or that you like the most, but the one that has the best name mm. or any name that you like. <laughs> got anything, Mike? Oh no, I'm racking my brain. I'm. Uh, int? Insert into, but that, that sounds like innuendo. 
<laughs> uh, so Andrew says int. That's technically a thing. I know that Mike is pulling out the book. He's he's now cheating. That's okay. Um, cheating is the gift that man gives himself. It's what separate him, separates him from the animals. <laughs> so the question is, what is the what do you think is the best name SQL Server feature? Or if you're interested in another database platform, the feature with the coolest name or most interesting name. And mine, I'll give mine, um, which was mostly a joke. That was always on availability groups because the name first availability groups, perfectly reasonable name actually kind of explains what it is. Always on is a lie. Uh, and always on sometimes has a space in it. Sometimes it doesn't have a space in it. Occasionally it has a hyphen in it. Marketing has switched this, I think three separate times. So nobody knows how, or Alan Hurt knows the correct way to do it, but nobody else knows how to use the phrase always on, uh, in the marketing appropriate sense. So that's my. That's my example of the best name because it's so good of a name that it's got three names. My top name is Top. Top? So you don't like Limit? No, I do like Limit, but... Oh, okay. I also like puns. I mean, Top is a pretty good name. It's hard to beat that. So somebody um, didn't catch the question, and I was trying to make sure I was logged into the second version of chat. Oh, hey, look at that. You're in chat as well. Generate series. It does what it's supposed to do. It does exactly what it says it's going to do. It generates a series. Um, yep, it explains what it does. So actually, in real life, my, my favorite one isn't in SQL Server, but it's Explode. And it's just the the gleeful 12 year old in me who loves it every time, every time you take an array and blow it up. Uh, sadly, Explode is not available in SQL Server under that name. So, all right, worst named SQL feature. Exists, yeah, existence. Uh, this this language has a long history of existence, sort of like uh, an animal house. Anders asks, do you want me to copy the questions in? I mean, you could um, if, if you don't want my clackety, but I can, I can do that too, because I have them. So the worst named SQL feature. And there's an interesting thought in here is always on. Yeah, always on is a terrible name for a SQL feature. It's it's a set of features. Um, if you want to say R2, the phrase R2, I will take that marketing person and be very upset with that marketing person because the term R2, they only used it in one edition of SQL Server. They've used it in several editions of Windows Server. Uh, is it worse than 6.5? Yeah, at least 6.5 says there was a 6. There will be a 7. But 6.5 is just in between. We're not, we're not ready for a real 7 yet, but you should pay us some money. And my recollection was that there wasn't actually a 6. Or at least it wasn't publicly available outside of, uh, outside of Redmond. But that is my recollection, and that goes back to well before. There was a six? Okay. Mind you, that was at a time uh, quite before I was into databases. So, uh, like Sanky asks, would a SQL Server feature by any other name smell as sweet? Maybe. See, if it's a really terrible name, people won't use it. And because they'll just not use it out of embarrassment. So there, there's a, there's some question about that. Uh, I was still in high school. I would have to confirm that. 
It might actually have been earlier than that, Anders. Extended procedures. Oh, extended procedures is a terrible name. Um, extended stored procedures. Yeah. So upgraded to 6.5 in late 1995. Yeah, I wasn't in high school by that point. Uh, now that I've doxed myself, now that you all know I've been to high school, um, <laughs> possibly strip TS Vector. Vacuum. Yeah, the name Vacuum is kind of silly. Um, and the concept of vacuuming is a little silly. Uh, gone through four versions of, high, of SQL before you graduated high school. That is about right. But Postgres vacuum, yeah, yeah. I'm going to vacuum up tuples. Um, column store has the tuple mover, but I like that term. I just dislike people who call it tuples. Um, if you if you pronounce them tuples, I mean, you're still okay. It's just I don't like it's tuples. So, Mike, do you have a name for the worst named SQL feature? So I was trying to think of the uh, programmatic one that was like, was it wait for or uh, try catch? Well, um, wait for, yeah, wait for is a, a syntax. You just wait for some amount of time or right. until some time. Remember there's one that in kind of the documentation, they're like, don't ever use this. <laughs> There are a few of those. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, here, you're going to learn this in one example. Don't ever do it again. Right. In case they ask you. PG dump. Yeah, the, the, the name for database backup in Postgres, also MySQL, where it's uh, a SQL dump. Uh, yeah, that's a name. That's a name for sure. Had to be... Had to be different. <laughs> <laughs> so following on, because Brian's all about the names. There's actually a reason for this, but uh, the SQL feature most likely to have been named by marketing. Oh, this reminds me of the Anna Hoffman um, night. And they're going over some of the new features, right? Got to check the notes. Yeah. <laughs> Commutator. <laughs> always on. Yeah, it's it's funny how often always on comes up in this conversation. You um, up? I'm going to go anything named world class. If you have to call something world class, it's not. Uh, that's, that's usually good advice. My name was Azure Data Studio which I think is really not a great name at all. Like, oh, so it's just for Azure. No, no, it's for on-premises SQL Server and Postgres. Okay, why did you call it Azure? Oh, because it works in Azure. Okay, but you don't need a cloud. It, it runs on-premises. It, it's just a, it's an application. It's a data studio. I mean, you could call it Data Studio, although then Google has a Data Studio as well, but Microsoft Data Studio. At, just throwing the name Azure on there, it reminds me of the time, what was it, like in, say, the late 90s, early, two, early aughts where they threw .NET on everything Microsoft did. So it was Visual Studio .NET and uh, Windows.net and everything.net. Adaptive slash intelligent query processing. Aimed by marketing. I could see that. Uh, so, no, they didn't add. That was just a typo there, the second G. The Toyota McDonald's drive through Prius. Uh, the 2017 version, back when it didn't really have any adaptability and not much intelligence. In 2019, more adaptability, more intelligence. 
and will lead me to a, a rant about how the death of the DBA is woefully uh, overrated in the sense that DBAs aren't going anywhere. Your auto fixing, auto auto deploying, auto working, auto functioning, everything databases, no, nah, they won't exist. Uh, I know that because the last time Microsoft made this claim, it was SQL Server 2000, where you don't need a DBA anymore. And DBAs, obviously, we haven't had any since 2000. Oh, we're going places to dollar land. Oh, so it's a, it's a Snowflake implementation. That was just too easy. Uh, slightly mean to Snowflake but deservedly mean to Snowflake. No humanoid robots in your office. They're, they are robots, but they're flesh bag robots. Anders, Anders gets it. Just streamed a bit of Snowflake today. So from a developer standpoint, Snowflake is really cool. From a person who has to pay for it standpoint, Snowflake gets expensive. And that's kind of oh, missing indexes. Technically not missing if they shouldn't be there in the first place. That's a fair point, Solomon. Yeah, I don't need to pay for it. Exactly. When you don't, when you don't need to pay, it's a really cool technology. And there, there are some very nice things, analytical functionality in there, which uh, makes it worth using for sure. Just when the bill comes, that's, that's when you duck. Missing indexes shouldn't be there in the first place. Yep. They're just, uh, you could call them rescue indexes. And they're in, this is the index shelter. So come home with a few extra indexes. Uh, treat them with love and care. Or just drop them whenever. You know, either way. That went dark pretty fast. So let's go on and talk about the most accurately named SQL feature, which you know we've we've talked about a little bit. That hey, quality of the name and accuracy of the name kind of works together pretty well. Um, select, select, maybe, because in relational world it's project, so you could just call it project, but then everybody would mispronounce it as project, and think <coughs> I'm opening a project. Window functions, window functions are very accurately named, yes. Backups, yeah, backup, backups are named well, although in MySQL and Postgres, we talked about those are dumps. Um, reporting services is fairly accurate. I wanted to come up with some fast quip about reporting services, but I wasn't able to, so yeah, yeah, some. Some is a some is a very accurate thing. It's definitely. I still call them dumps just to throw off the junior people. Anders, at your age, um, that you know, that is always a question. So, Mike, what do you got for accurately named SQL features? Um, stream aggregate operators. <laughs> You're just, you just found a page in the book. You're like, <laughs> I was like, you're so ahead of me. I just logged in to make sure I could type stuff that, that I see that you just type most accurately named really fast. So you beat me. <laughs> date part and date trunk are pretty clear. Uh, Current times. That's a date part. I'm with you completely. Date trunk, I, truncating dates. Yeah, I know. I know that it was fairly easy to pick up on um, when working in PLSQL, uh, or not PLSQL, excuse me, PSQL. Um, yeah, I could see that. I can see that. Now, <laughs> now, now is an appropriately named function. Yes. Or uh, get date in T-SQL. Yeah. Since you've called all of these questions, named features, etc., are there unnamed features? How well do they work? Do people know they exist? Sankey is getting philosophical on us. Are there unnamed features? Absolutely. 
How well do they work? Probably not that great, because <laughs> if they worked really great, they'd probably have names. Do people know they exist? Sometimes yes, but not necessarily uh, by a name. Ghost Cleanup and Uniqueifier to good names. Uh, Ghost Cleanup is actually a pretty good, it's a pretty good name. And I do like to think about Ghostbusters in that regard. Um, Uniqueifier. I think that's, that feels like the type of word that somebody threw out because they didn't know the proper word. And then it stuck and eventually became a, uh, a term that people used. Cumulative distribution, and I'm not, I'm not even going to do the, uh, the function name of it, but the cumulative distribution, it's, it's a nice window function, uh, for small data sets sucks for huge data sets because how slow things can get ghost cleanup. Yeah. Um, ghost cleanup is when Slimer gets through, uh, in your hallway, <laughs> got to do some ghost cleanup. It is a perfectly cromulent word. Um, dense rank is a good insult. You are both dense and rank. So let's talk about, in that regard, least accurately named features. Always on. I'm waiting for it. Two char. So you don't like two char at all, Maddie? Uh, my answer, by the way, is the timestamp data type, which is rather poorly named in SQL Server because it's not a timestamp at all. It's actually a binary blob that gets thrown on as, as an, uh, Almost like a ticker. Uh, is numeric. Uh, is is numeric. Yeah, that is a fun feature because it will take in your text. If if you have octal or hexadecimal text, then yeah, that's still numeric. So and it will, it'll tag it as that? Yep. Uh, it will say, sure, that looks numeric. Mm. Updated. Oh, in a, in triggers. Yeah. The update. Was this updated? No. Well, you can't actually tell. Even though it says updated. Maybe. Maybe it was updated. If I want to char something, it's on a barbecue. If you want a var char, it got to be in the south. Then it get var charred. Uh, I believe that is a Louisiana term, but I, please correct me, chat, if I'm wrong. At, at identity. Um, I think that's a reasonably named piece of functionality. It's just that it's not always the correct identity value. So, yeah, of course, use scope identity instead of at, at identity, but... Uh, you know, it still gets you the identity value. It worked fine prior to 2000. Yeah. With some functionality. Who who wants that? I mean, it still works fine today if you don't have triggers or nesting or complication. Creating volatile functions. That's a good, that's a good one. Yeah. I, uh... For insert slash update slash delete. After is appropriate as well as instead of, but for. So this is a trigger for insertion. Um, yeah, if, if you stick with the, the nominal forms there, insert, update, delete. Uh, or sorry, if you don't switch to nominal, that's what I meant to say. If you don't switch to nominal forms, insertion, Updating, I don't know, deletion, 
Updation. I don't know. We're going to uniquify Updation. And in that case, for insertion, yeah. Yeah, for modification. I know modification, not updation, but... Uh, instead of works for... Or I think is somebody just trying to save a couple of keystrokes instead of writing after. What do people think about raise error? Is it really raise an error? Sometimes. But the fact that there's one E in raise error, a little weird. Probably less weird than if it had two. But maybe it's just because I'm so used to it. E after E except after R. Right. But four isn't a win. Raise error is a legacy command. Yeah, that goes back to the Sybase days. Where bytes were expensive. Back in my day, we didn't have bytes. We gave each child one bit, and they were happy. Then that you have to have these jokes on 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 the go. It's <laughs> ASN dot one. I'm not even sure what that is. ASN dot one, huh? Unless you're you're giving an example of a terrible name because. Uh, we needed to make this command as short as possible because, in fairness, when you only have, say, a few hundred bytes to work with, you keep those commands short. The max row limit in the olden days. There, yeah. <clears throat> Bit specs for crypto and network binary exchange. Those are... Those are something. Uh, I, I'm, I don't know. I like I like names that are clear. They actually have bit length counts and bit packing. Okay. I understand the benefits of bit packing, and at certain levels, I'm all for bit packing. Uh, please. Never try bit packing in a database. Don't do I've I've had to tear that apart before. Not a good answer. Doesn't matter if looks like things are gonna get big. Please never do that. Do it when you're talking about wire protocols and you wanna send as much information in a single byte as possible or in a single packet as possible. Do that. I'm cool with that. Normal humans never have to see that. Uh, it's it's where you get to, I'm going to replicate this idea because it was really cool for this extremely low level operation. Wire protocols in the 50s. Oh, even, even TCP. Yeah. Uh, you know, you look at the TCP spec and there's a lot of packing within that, the first, the header. It's like, if this bit is set, then this, uh, Flag is set. It's the flags that they use. Explain. Yeah, explain is a is a fun name. At least at least it does. It does explain things if you understand exactly what it's saying. Now, if you don't follow what what it's trying to do, explain may need an explainer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, this one was one of my one of the questions I enjoyed. SQL feature that should throw a hard 24 error if you try to use it in a new project, but will continue to work for all of your existing garbage. So, uh, if you're not that familiar with SQL Server, uh, t uh, level 24 error is essentially shut off the server now. So, basically, if you could flip a switch and say kill this functionality except in the garbage I have to support because I can't get rid of it. Anders says XML. EMO? I don't even know what EMO is unless you're talking 
Unless you're talking about uh, Dashboard Confessional, in which case I still don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Just putting that on the record. Emergency machine off. Okay, yeah, think of it that way. Some some piece of functionality that if somebody tried to start a new project and included it, uh, you would want to shut the machine off. I actually had some trouble thinking of a good answer for this because even the hardest garbage that people can think of, um, it's still got use cases for the most part. I mean, it's rare that something comes into a system, whatever data platform you, you're talking about, and has absolutely no benefit. Solomon hits on a thing that may in fact be one of those bits, numbered procedures. Numbered procedures, yep. Um, the only reason I might not include it is simply because you can count on about two hands the number of people who actually know uh, number about numbered procedures. So you're so unlikely to find them unless you're Anders, and in which case you found all kinds of weird stuff. That's fair. <laughs> but most people have never heard of the thing, so they can't abuse it. However, if you have heard of it, uh, not even once. I have 32 of them. <laughs> the max has 1,286. Uh, so for people who are not aware, numbered procedures essentially allow you to call the same stored procedure name. No, don't tell them. <laughs> it has come up before. It, it's, it has I come remember. up. Actually, I think Solomon brought it up before. Um, but like the same name, but then it calls a different procedure altogether. It's different um, body. And... There's some really stupid reason why you might possibly want it, but oh, object-oriented programming devs love them to the extent that it helps them feel like they have overloading. I ha I can have eight procedure calls, each of which has a different signature, but even they thankfully don't know about this. They're not OOP, but get mistaken for being that. Right. They're, yes, they're not properly object-oriented. Uh, and as a functional guy, I will rag on object-oriented programming all day. But there's one good use case, not to clutter up SSMS. They're very much not overloading. Okay, Solomon has corrected me on this. I think this is the second time you've corrected me on it. Thankfully, my brain is incapable of remembering numbered procedures appropriately. Um, the best way not to clutter up SSMS is to take all of the numbered procedures and drop them. That's that's my pro tip for tonight. You must include the number in the name, hence they're still unique names. They still show up as one procedure in SSMS. Yeah, the the concept just keeps getting dumber and dumber as people explain it. And I want to figure out which customer had this burning desire that I'm only allowed to have 12 names. So I need a way of separating out names and giving them separate numbers. I don't understand how that conversation could go. And furthermore, how you'd actually benefit from it. SSMS and other things simply don't support them. It is a garbage feature. I give you that. Um, my, my example of something that should halt and catch fire, as Lysanke pointed out, non-schema bound table valued functions, user defined table valued functions. I'm going to go with that, uh, just, to just to toss a bomb in the room. Um, table valued functions in SQL server are, uh, 
Actually, I should say non-schema bound table valued functions, especially uh, multi-statement. I bet you can count on one hand how many people on the SQL Server dev team knows about numbered procedures. Given that I think you can count on two hands how many people on the planet know it, I think you're right. It's probably somewhere buried in the code base somewhere that they're never going to touch because you change that, who knows what'll break. And there's gonna be one customer, one customer who relies on this. My entire business is built around numbered procedures. And that one customer pays $4 million a year for licensing. Yeah, I was gonna say, it'd be your one of your 80, 20 top customers. Yeah, it's non, gotta be. Non-schema bound table value function. Yep. If you're gonna want, put a big X next to it. Yes, if you want a uh, terrible performance, it's a good way to get it. Poorly written multi-statement table valued functions. And I know the SQL Server team spent a lot of time trying to make them faster. Um, and Are I know schema bound ones okay though? Schema bound helps, but frankly, it's still not good. Um, you can have table valued functions be fast in certain circumstances. I understand inline table valued functions can be quite fast. Um, but just avoid them. That is actually where the object oriented programmer people go that they find table valued functions and uh, nested views and I can build out my object model. And it works really great in dev where I have four rows. And then it gets to production and it doesn't scale and obviously it's the database's fault. Do not apply 2019 CU9 or CU10. I might have missed that bit. Uh, but like Sankey says, my brother taught me about business. There's only one thing worse than having no customers is having one customer. Yeah, or having one elephant customer. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, they are actually, elephants. there's a term for this. It's the Walmart curse, where uh, if you have a an enormous company working with you as a acknowledged smaller company, uh, they expect that they get to push you around. So now you're you're an extension of their team, where we need this to uh, to get done. We need your product to do this thing. And as a actually as a practical example of this, you had um, React, which was a similar product to DynamoDB to Cassandra. It was in that space. I liked React because it had um, CRDTs conflict resilient data types. So you could have independent of wall clocks, a way of guaranteeing that in a distributed system, I would get things in the correct order, regardless of when they came in and regardless of which client, which, uh, which node I'm hitting. So react had one major customer, the weather channel and uh, the Weather Channel wanted time series data. So they spent a whole bunch of money going into time series and they found out that none of their other customers really cared and they couldn't bring in new customers who did care. And as a result, uh, the company owning them, Basho, as I recall, they either were sold off to the Weather Channel or they went bankrupt and were bought by the Weather Channel. Uh, React itself, I think has, had been reverted back to open source status, but this was a while ago, so have to I'd have to look into that. But you know, that's that is one of the many risks that you play. But even if you have an ongoing relationship, uh, it's a relationship where you're on the wrong side of it. Major bug in the performance improvement for functions. Okay. Airbus 380. Yeah, that was that was an interesting project as well. That was driven by, um, for a bad case of one customer, Air Emirates, okay, Emirates Air, yeah. 
I was trying to remember. I knew it was it was going to be one of the Middle Eastern airlines, but I couldn't remember if it was Emirates or if it was a different one. So I didn't want to say too loud. But sure, we we want you to build this plane. Okay, well, an airplane is what billions of dollars of research and funding. So sure, we'll give you a lot of money, but we we want you to build it exactly for us. And that is a plane which. You don't tend to see too many 380s around because it's so expensive and the requirements it meets are like, I can fly from, say, New York to Dubai. Okay, but it's completely um, not fuel efficient for a flight within the U.S. And it's far too large for uh, most domestic flights pretty much anywhere in the world. So that's another case, yeah. Sometimes I feel like we're the last Oracle customer, but I don't think it's true. <laughs> I think Oracle's had a little bit of a resurgence, unfortunately. Um, no, no, I think they've had they've had a bit of a resurgence in the last couple of years. Uh, there was a multi-year period where it did seem like everybody was moving off. That going to move to one platform or another. Because of Azure. Yeah, that's right. Oracle Cloud. Oracle Cloud's not bringing them in, but Helen working on um, on getting Oracle to work in Azure. I should, I don't know. I, I would say I should, I should write her an email and tell her, stop doing that. I want Oracle to go away. <laughs> not be successful. <laughs> Helen has made Oracle more money than their own salespeople. Seriously, she is extremely good at her job. And I was surprised that Microsoft hired her. So if you don't know who we're talking about, um, Kellen Povon Gorman, she uh, actually presented for TriPass a couple of times. And she has a long and storied history working uh, for Delphix, working in the Oracle community. She's a member of the Oak Table. Extremely good at uh, performance tuning Oracle and making it work for customers. And now, Microsoft hired her and she was working on Power BI for a little bit and is currently, I believe, uh, helping Oracle customers migrate into Azure successfully. Mm. And she's had some blog posts about doing testing of on-prem versus Azure uh, performance using things like DB Hammer. So yeah, I, I could believe it that she's made Oracle a lot of money over the years. So the SQL feature that just needs a little bit of love to be great, cursors. Now, Anders, that implies that cursors aren't already great. And how did DB Hammer not come up in our earlier discussion? That sounds amazing. Yep, DB Hammer, that's a good name. They, they could be greater. All right, I'll give you that. So needs a little love to be even greater than it currently is. You ask yourself, what could you do? What 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 product? If there was one feature in SQL Server that you said, I wish this was a little bit different, and then it would be fantastic. Common table expressions. If you could um, serialize common table expressions or materialize them, that's the term I was trying to use. If you could materialize a common table expression on demand, yeah, that would be a killer piece of functionality because uh, use more than once, right. I mean, that's um, that's the key benefit, more like C inline functions. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, I wanna take that, that result set from the single common table expression that I know runs fast and materialize that. And currently you can do it by inserting into a temp table and joining that way, but there are some cases where I can't do this, like say of inside a view, where I can't create temp tables inside of views and I get one select operation. So uh, yeah, that would be a fantastic in, uh, improvement for common table expressions. Um, supporting more of the window functions that, I mean, obviously I've been working on that, but you know, like the window in clause, I was going to show an example of that because that is killer, but it's not all supported. 
Yep, yep. I was actually going to take the same example because I'm reading the same book as Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's so there's some functionality in window functions that we've seen major improvements over the years. Postgres has pretty much all of the SQL standard for um, window functions. And everybody else has lagged behind a bit. But um, one thing that is coming, one thing that is coming in Azure, is currently there in Azure SQL Edge, is last observation carried forward. So basically, if I have some value and then I have a bunch of nulls, and then I have a new value. Um, what I want to say is fill in all those nulls with the prior value. Just give me the last observation, and I don't care how many nulls I have in between, just fill them all in. So you get that with... Uh, edge. Yep, you do an Azure SQL Edge, and there, the specific functionality is ignore nulls, as I recall. So banning certain people named Bob Ward from using Cowboys references in their demos. You could do that, but then he'll just change it to another Dallas-based team. So the Stars or whoever else plays in Dallas. That was that was some sass about the Mavericks. Though I don't even know if they're in Dallas anymore. I haven't paid attention to the NBA since Charles Barkley was there. Okay, I'm going to change Brian's question because I don't think his next question makes any sense. So it is now the SQL feature that could never be great even with Barry White levels of love. Feature that could never be great. It just doesn't matter how much time, how much effort, how many developers they throw at it it's always going to suck. Oh. I had actually heard a talk by one of the original people on the team it was on .NET Rocks, and I forget what that feature was. It was terrible. It still doesn't work. So, Rajesh, is that distributed availability groups? That's a case where if you threw enough money and resources, okay, you could probably make something that seems useful. And if you're actually, if you're going from SQL Server on Windows to SQL Server on Linux, um, or if you're doing a full-on transition, like I'm, I'm switching servers, I'm switching editions of SQL Server, that's the type of thing where you'd say, well, a distributed availability group feels like a great answer to this. But it does seem like that was something that they kind of half-heartedly put out, and I don't know how much time they've spent since then. I wish I had it going from DEC Alpha to Intel. Yeah, helps with that sort of migration strategy. You know, I just, I just use Windows to Linux, um, but yeah, but then you might ask, well, why would you ever switch off of DEC Alpha? And somewhere, somewhere TG is listening and saying, Itanium, a bug in ODBC. What that, that would be a reason if if it was a significant enough bug. I actually don't know uh, about deck alpha. Corrupting data at a high transaction count. That'll do it. That's a good reason to switch off. What about um, using SQL Server in, in Linux? Is that still something that is continuing to improve or? It's there, it's, it's improving for sure. Um, so the interesting part about it is that in 2017, you had a lot of talks about this. Hey, here's SQL Server, right. it's on Linux. And you stopped hearing talks about it for, I think, two reasons. Number one is not all the functionality is there. So 
Um, in that regard, no, it's not 100% the Windows version. But number two, for the most part, it's just the same product that I can run a demo using a container in Linux and I'm going to get the same results. It's actually kind of boring. If you're not talking about specifically administering SQL Server on Linux, if you're mentioning, you know, like the session you're going to do on window functions, you could run everything on Linux and it'll work. It'll look just the same. It's just pretty boring at that point where, yeah, here's SQL Server on Linux. Here are the limitations. Otherwise, it's just the same product you've already known. Gotcha. Connect to it the same way. You interface with it the same way. It gives you back the same results. Uh, if you didn't use ADAPT version, you probably wouldn't even know that it was Linux as opposed to Windows unless you tried to use one of the features that's currently not supported. Right. Okay. So for example, distributed availability groups need a locking mechanism fixed where you lock it on primary, it gets locked everywhere in the environment. That could be an issue. I, I see where you're coming from there. Yep. All right. SQL feature most likely to be a project manager or program manager's pet project. So some feature in SQL Server that you look at that and say, I'll bet you that there was a PM who just kept pushing and pushing. There's never a customer who is interested in this. But there's a PM who swears up and down. This is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> Power BI. <laughs> oh, that's... Shots fired, Anders. Do you have any ideas, Mike? Um, I'm thinking of the, the, the improvements in the temp tables, but that's not. Oh, um, yeah, hecatonized temp DB. Uh, memory optimized temporary tables. And uh, it's a really good concept. Implementation. Right, it fit the model. I remember. I, I was remember forgetting the key element of that presentation. The implementation. I don't know. I I want to see how it works for companies that are running at really large scale, because that's the intent. Like this is the solution for specific uh, temporary table problems around allocation of massive numbers of temp tables. I'm curious what things it breaks that you don't expect. Because as soon as you turn on uh, memory optimized temp DB, you know, do you now have problems with cross database queries that use temp tables? Well, the temp tables themselves aren't memory optimized, you know, the ones that you create, just the metadata in temp, in temp DB. But if you're querying that metadata in temp DB, now you have to follow the same rules that in memory OLTP does. And those rules have always just been too limiting. That's a product that I think uh, would be fantastic if it got a lot more attention. But the funny thing about memory optimized tables is they're not intended for fast select, despite what you would think that you would think, oh, this, because it's always in memory, uh, the rows are always in memory, so therefore I don't have to hit disk to read. That's actually not why they're fast. It's fast because it's really fast to write. Um, so for OLTP scenarios. It's not going to be read much, yeah. Yeah. Reading is not faster. Um, probably be great for my hosted environment. Right. If you have massive creation of temp tables turning those schema objects into into memory optimized tables sure a thousand databases with ident identical temp table names that's some that's some temp table reuse i i approve of the reuse there uh however i don't approve of the latches and locks necessary to be able to write to those tables to say, yep, it's my turn to use this temp table. Uh, 
So I'm gonna so give wrote the... F integration. Yeah. Yeah. What's that, Mike? Someone wrote F integration, F sharp integration. Well, if it was F sharp integration, um, that would actually be awesome. <laughs> I However, thought somebody was trolling you, but I might misunderstand it. Yeah, okay. And Anders couldn't get he couldn't hit the shift in the three in time. Run with 5,000 yeah. worker threads for a reason. That is the way to roll. If if you don't have so many worker threads that the uh, database engine throws an error message or a warning message at you, clearly not pushing it hard enough. Shift three fires my healing bot. <laughs> so SQL feature most likely to have been an intern summer project. The thing where you look at it and say, I don't think a professional actually wrote this thing. Like SQL agent jobs. At least the database portion. Oh, lots of triggers. <laughs> the original error message for truncation. Stringer binary data would be truncated. It is technically accurate. Um, where's Solomon for CLR security? That's, yeah. Speaking of things that can never be great, CLR security. CLR security is already fine. Don't, don't try to break it by putting it into a terrible model that doesn't really work. What would have been feature restrictions? Right, feature restrictions, the product that didn't even make it past the beta. So I want to end on a high note. So I've skipped a couple of the questions, but uh, SQL feature I'll probably never use, but I like that it exists. I'll give my answer because I think I want to give my answer before Anders gives his answer so that he can't steal my answer. Uh, query store plan forcing for cursors. It's, it's actually really easy to dunk on cursors. Trust me, do it all the time. <laughs> and how poorly they perform. But if you are you know, appropriately using a cursor and you need to maximize the performance of it, the idea that they've got the capability, that they were able to say, well, this can work for cursors as well. And sometimes cursors do need uh, forced plans to perform as well as they can. So it's something that I will probably never use, but I think it shows some of the level of maturity in Query Store that I don't think they massive, they avoided any real obvious features uh, I think it can definitely get better. I think they can add more to it, but I don't think this was the type of thing that you know, took a bunch of uh, developer hours to to put into place and therefore prevented them from doing something better. I think it was it was a nice uh, nice little hey we have a complete product so complete it's cursors plan forcing never used. Yeah, um, query store could also fall in the need some love. It does, it does definitely need more uh, TLC for sure. Yeah, Solomon CLR strict security. That's the term I was thinking of. That was a rush job designed for Azure SQL database, not on premises. Completely agree with that. I mean, that was their, oh crap, with CLR, people can see other databases. We better shut off CLR, but oh crap, we have big name customers who are paying and want to use CLR. Uh, let's do something. Let's do something about this. Query Store follows un falls under the summer intern project. The first version of Query Store. Oh yeah. Yeah. Nebulous. Oh, go ahead, Mike. This isn't a dig, but just polybase. Do, do many people use that? 
Not many people use that, no. It's Polybase is actually my thing that one of my things that if they put a bit more love into, I think it can be significantly better. And I think it could be a replacement for linked servers, for example. But um They've put some of the love into it. I've, I actually see it in Azure Synapse Analytics, and I see it you know, in the Azure world, but I want that on premises. I'm not sure that customers ever really could see other databases, though. We were told that they could, but I'm not convinced it ever happened. Ah, so that's, that's kind of interesting, Solomon. Um, this is... I am not sure. Basically, I was going off of what they said. So that's interesting. And speaking of interesting, oh, that feature where you can store data in Azure and on-prem, StretchDB. StretchDB. That was, so StretchDB is a really cool feature if it cost like 1 50th of the amount that it actually does. Because the whole idea is I have data that I don't care much about, but I care just enough to keep it. I want to put that in the cheapest possible place and hide it away until I can safely delete it. StretchDB comes in and says, yeah, we can do that at $23 a terabyte. No, because the whole point is I want less expensive storage. I can pay and get better disk for a lot less. By the way, it's like 23, ter I believe it was $23 per terabyte per month. Maybe it was a lot higher than that. Maybe now it's, uh, I don't know. I just remember that they were using premium storage and it was, it was at a point where actually it had to be more than $23 per terabyte. It had to be something closer than like $2,300 per terabyte. So I'm off by a couple orders of magnitude, but it was bad. It was at the point where I remember pricing it out and saying I could buy a brand new SAN every month for less money than it would take to use StretchDB. So I believe it was $2,300 per terabyte. Rack space, $1,000 per month per terabyte. Yeah, I, I think I think StretchDB actually ended up being more expensive than that. But again, I'd have to go back, do the math. I'll go back and do the math for my stock portfolio. Maybe I'll do some investing. <laughs> so I want to end on uh, the nebulous springtime analogy. Does cutting your lawn make your, gra your grass grow faster? If so, can cutting your lawn too frequently make it so fast that you can't keep up? I believe that you will hit the central limit theorem at some point. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that um, we can have an integral of grass clipping quantity of, of that volume. And we'll find out the appropriate answer. And that's all I've got for tonight. Thank you everybody for tuning in, having some fun with some questions for, uh, from Brian, former SQL Server user group member, former colleague of mine, now person in the mist. He shows up every once in a while, but generally he's in the mist. So everyone have a wonderful evening. Catch you in two weeks tomorrow. I'm going to be talking about normalization for our advanced DBA group. Next week, Mike is actually talking about window functions and our data science meeting, data, data science and BI. Eugene Meidinger is going to talk about uh, an advanced introduction to DAX. We've got a full month, three straight weeks. Check it out Tuesday. Meetup.com slash tripass. And we'll catch you next time. Until then, take care. Thank you.